Thank you for uh, joining us online, being with us today. I uh, hope this is a blessing to you. We are doing this uh, uniquely today and next Sunday as well so that uh, we can do uh, what our governments ask us to do and do it in a very safe manner. So we want to have a controlled environment, but we also want to have church. And we want this to be a great time, a wonderful time for all of our members. So uh, I know there are a lot of concerns that are out there. And uh, we're going to do everything that we can to communicate. We need your help in that. Help us to communicate with each other. Uh, if there's anything, uh, a prayer request or concerns or things that we can help in at all, just uh, call the office, uh, call one of the staff, call me, call one of the deacons. Just let us know, and we'll do our best to communicate over the next couple of weeks. I know it's going to be unusual. It's going to be different. But I really believe that this is going to be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I really believe that God has something that, we're going to look back on and we're going to say this was an unbelievable work of the hand of God. And we would not have gone through this, if we had not gone through this, this experience, then uh, we, we would have not had this, whatever the this is, that we don't know what it is yet. But uh, God is God, God is good, and God is under control. And I just want to thank you for your love for New Holland. Uh, more important than that, your love for God. And uh, today is the day that we want to serve the Lord. We want to be glad in this day. And I'm grateful for all the things that God's doing. I've asked Broadus Duncan, if he would, to come and lead us in prayer. And then we will uh, have our worship service together. Let us pray together. Lord, we come before you to, to honor you, to worship you. Now let's pray, Lord, that you'll still us. Help us to recognize who you are. Lord, prepare us to worship as we come together. Lord, we know that uh, you are our life. We know that you are our future, and we owe all that we are to you. And Lord, as we come together, we truly want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we come before you uh, with many things on our mind. Uh, people thinking about the situation that we're in, and help us, Lord, to realize that we can trust in you we know that by the way you have done things in the past that you can be counted on and help us, Lord, to rely upon you. Help us to pay, place our faith in you and not allow things uh, that are, are around us to determine how we feel or what we think. Lord, we come in behalf of our nation. We are struggling. And Lord, we don't know what to do in many of the situations that we're facing I pray for wisdom for the people who are uh, running our government and our businesses and our medical uh, facilities. I pray, Lord, that you give them the wisdom to make the right decisions that uh, this pan uh, pandemic that we're facing would uh, just ease away. And Lord, we pray that uh, the facilities and all that we need would be available and, uh, and this situation could clear up. I do pray for my church family. I pray, Lord, that you give us uh, a wisdom to, to do the right things, to, to make ourselves safe. May we uh, go into places that uh, we actually just need to go, and may we take care of ourselves that we uh, would all stay healthy. Lord, this is a special time, and we dedicate it to you. We come to glorify you, to lift you up, because... You are truly the name above all names, the name that is worthy to be praised. And that's our purpose and reason for being here tonight. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable unto you. For you are our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Broadus. We're going to sing now. and. What we're going to do is we're going to sing here, but we're not singing for you. We're hoping you're going to sing with us. And so we're going to do a great song of testimony. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. He 
save me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. Oh, I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? I'm so glad. That the Lord saved me. He 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 saved me. And because we're saved, we have a great reason to sing, and for that reason, He keeps us singing. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in the love my stand and flow. Jesus, 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 sweet as God fill my heart with pain. Jesus wept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweet as may I know, is my every longing. He's receiving us. We sing about him and we also know that he loves us and for that reason we can testify that he is the lover of our soul. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. Taken me from the mighty clay. You set my feet upon the rock, and now I go. Oh, and sing this with your heart now. I love you. I need you. Though my world will fall, I'll never let you go. My All the ladies sing. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. Set my feet upon the rock, and now I know. All right, 
Let's sing it with your heart now, everybody sing. I I love love We'll share a song with you that uh, everyone will know. A Christian anthem, more or less. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Praise God, 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 praise
Thank you all for singing. Thank you for tuning in once again. And we're going to be looking at a couple of scriptures um, beginning in the, with the book of James, James chapter 1. Uh, joy in all things is what I want to talk about today, having joy in all things. We've been entering into a very difficult time uh, in our country as brought us as prey. And we've been going through those things that, uh, you know, most of us have never faced in this lifetime. And um, matter of fact, I've never seen anything like what our country is facing now. And uh, I remember my dad saying that there were some things that he faced in his life that literally changed the country. Uh, my dad talked about when Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, um, a day that our president said would live in infamy. And truly, it, it did uh, change our country, and really, it changed the war world when we went into the, the Second World War. Um, we, um, he, he said the other thing that he remembered that was uh, very altering for our country was, uh, in his opinion, was the Cuban Missile Crisis, back when Russia put those missiles in Cuba and pointed them at America, and we knew about them. We had pictures of them, and uh, people were starting to build bomb shelters in their backyard, and especially in the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, fear was everywhere. Uh, they didn't know when the bomb, they, matter of fact, they were told that the bomb could come at any point in time. And uh, those are, he said the churches were full. Uh, that was when I was born, so I don't remember those days. But he said people came, and it was a lasting effect, and it really impacted all of the United States during that very difficult, you know, turbulent time. You know, to, to say there, there were two events, and both of those events were very traumatic for our country and, and had lasting effects. Um, in my life, you know, we could talk about 9-11, but that affected us for a while, and, and it had some longer effects on us. I remember uh, October 19th, 1987, we know it as Black Monday, when our uh, stock market went down 22% in one day. It's amazing to remember that it was only about 2,500 at that time. Uh, now, in the last few weeks, we've gone from almost 30,000 in our start market, start mar stock market to 20,000. So we've lost a third of our uh, market value now. But wouldn't it be great if the Bible actually said something to help us? I mean really help us during these difficult times? Actually, I believe that it does. There's a lot of the Word of God that uh, we know that needs to become real to us. It needs to become alive to us. There are things in this Word that, that we know in our, in our minds, but I'm not sure that we're living in our hearts. And sometimes God allows us to go through things, and I'll just get straight to it. In James chapter 1, this is the brother of Jesus the one who was not a believer in Jesus until he saw the resurrected Christ. And, and he became that one of the great leaders in the early church. As a matter of fact, he was the leader of the church, uh, the believers in Jerusalem. And he was the one that everybody looked to for wisdom and guidance and counsel. When he wrote this epistle, in the very second verse that he wrote, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, difficult circumstances. And he just says, count it all joy. It, it sounds so flowery. It sounds so uh, religious. It's almost like he's saying, cheer up. If we're not careful, it almost sounds like pie-in-the-sky theology. You know, that, okay, we're just supposed to be happy. We're, we're just supposed to act like there's no big deal. But even though it may sound like it's totally unattached and unrelated to to all of our difficult human struggles, it really is not. Because our God is a very practical God. And, and He only knows truth. He is truth. It is the very essence of His life and His nature. So it's much more than we are, but it's not more than He is. So it speaks the loudest when the great is the neat, the, 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 the greatest. So I want to talk to you today about, um, let's talk about some of the things that may fight against what James was talking about when he said, count it all joy. What is it that fights against our joy? And I know two that 
uh, I'm going to say right off the bat, and uh, number one, I think that when we have fear in our life, and nobody is immune from that, there are always going to be difficult times that are a normal reaction is going to be fear. But I personally believe greater than fear is the fear of loss. I think more than just being afraid or fearful is we think that we're going to lose something. And that's when it becomes very personal to us. And, and we're afraid that if we lose something, like if we, we're afraid of, of losing our health, that seems to be absolutely uh, uh, stigmatizing our country right now. It's, it, we, we want our health to be number one. And matter of fact, oftentimes in church services, and, and we'll have prayer times and prayer gatherings, and, and we'll take prayer requests, most of the prayer requests that we have in church are about health issues. It seems to just drive people. It knocks them to their knees. They care about their health, and they also care about their wealth. We, we say that money's not important, but my goodness, it goes up to the top of the list of things that we worry about. Our jobs, our job security, our savings. The market went down one-third. What are we going to do now? What about our retirement? What, what am I going to do when I retire one day? You know, th those are just things that people naturally worry about. Am I going to have the money to be able to pay this bill? Am I, I've got a house payment. I've got a car payment. I, I've got a Visa and a MasterCard or whatever. Uh, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay for those things? And that really goes to fear not only about their health and their wealth, but their lifestyle. I think people are very worried that their lifestyle will be changed and they're not going to like it. That they want the things that benefit them, and, and if there's something going on that, that does, they think might take away from their lifestyle, they're scared to death. You know, uh, will I be able to do what I want to do? Will I be able to go out to eat? Will I be able to uh, have vacation this year? Will something be taken from me? I also think one of the things that people are afraid of is the loss of control. Now, control is an illusion, but we don't want to admit that. And we don't like it at all when things get bigger than us where we can't handle it, where we can't have a say, where we can't control it. Paul said to his young protege, protege in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, this is a verse many people know, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind, sound thinking. He said there may be a spirit of fear, but that's a spirit that does not come from God. That spirit of fear comes from the devil. But the spirit that comes from God is not fear. The spirit that comes from God is the spirit of, of power, God's power. The, the spirit of love, God's love. The spirit of sound thinking, a sound mind. God is omniscient. He knows all. And God's Spirit gives us uh, all the wisdom that we need. God's power is there to, to unleash all the power of heaven. The author of the universe can step into our personal lives and give us exactly what we need in that moment. That's the Spirit of God. So we talked about the things that may fight against our joy. Let's talk about God's process of finding joy. And we find joy through the normal, everyday things of life that may bring us joy. You see, something occurs, and we'll either see it, we'll hear it, hear about it, something, or we'll sense something is going on. And, and the way that God built us, it manifests itself in our emotions. We talked a little bit about emotions, and uh, our emotions are real, and and. Our emotions are normally short-term. So we see something, we hear something, we'll, we'll react to it, and, and it's, a, it's a very short-term thing. So if we hear a joke, we'll laugh about it. We won't laugh about it for a week, but we'll, you know, we'll laugh about it for a few seconds or, or something like that. Or something will startle us and scare us, and we'll shriek or fall back, and then we'll look at it and say, hey, that's actually not a snake, it's a rubber snake, and we'll calm down a little bit. And our emotions are there. Emotions God gave to everybody, and, and God gave them to, uh, to us so that we could process the normal things of life. Some things bring us great joy. Some things bring us great happiness. 
Some things make us angry. That's an emotion. Some things uh, um, just uh, scare us to death. Now, the problem is, is we all have these emotions and we all sense and feel those things. But what happens if those emotions, though they're supposed to be short term, what if they are unresolved emotions? What if they linger? What if we don't process them and come to and find some kind of truth about them? Matter of fact, did you know that, that dreams, you know, you go to sleep at night and you have dreams, those dreams are unresolved emotions? Have you ever gone to uh, sleep at night and there was something that you were thinking about or going through that day and you dreamed about it all night? Have you ever had a, been watching a TV show and, and then all of a sudden you're, dr you're dreaming about that, what was going on in that TV show and, and, and you're putting yourself in that? that? But it's because it was just an emotion that was there and because it wasn't resolved, it lingered even into your sleep. That's what dreams are. You might have, be having a conversation or there may be a fear there or, or something that's going on in your life and, and your, your life is still trying to process it. But if you don't resolve those emotions and they linger longer, they become what the psychologists call a mood state. Now this can last days or weeks, maybe in, even into months. You ever saw somebody and say, man, they're in a mood. You know, you just look at them and they just look angry. Or they just are crying. You want to say, what's wrong? And they be, they're just sad all the time. That's when the emotion's there, and they didn't have an ability to, to process through the emotion. And, and because they didn't process through, process through it, it, it's become longer. And if we uh, don't process them even then, it'll move from what the psychologists call a mood state to what is called a core effect. And this is when it becomes long-term thinking. And when you have a core effect in your life, unless something challenges that thought process, challenges it and seeks to change it, it may become long-term. Long-term to the place that people can stay in these core effects for years. We know some of these. If we uh, think about them and, and people can stay in, in, a, in an absolute terrible place for them, for months it affects everything they do not just one aspect it'll affect them from the time that they wake up in the morning to the time that they go bed at night it'll uh, affect every relationship sometimes it will affect every conversation because our emotions are there and they're unresolved and that's the way that we process things but when we get to this place of a core effect and and it's not processed then it can become very dangerous. And then it can become what the, the scientists call a state of being. And that can last a lifetime. Like depression. People find a state of depression. Anxiety. That affects everything. It's, it's like glasses that, that they put on and they see the world through the color of these glasses. Things like, well, greed. There may be something that happened that had to deal with money, loss there, fear of loss. And it began to affect their, their whole thinking about money. And then it affects everything that they do. So it affects their job. It affects their, their relationships. It affects everything because everything is sorted through this state of, of, of greed or maybe negativity. You ever been around somebody that everything that they went through was about a state of negativity or bitterness? Something happened in their life and they never got over it and they just became a bitter person. In certain extremes, we could say narcissism. Pride, I call it pride on steroids, to where it, that, that put it lifting themselves up, where it becomes a way that they live their life. And so every relationship, even the most small, insignificant relationships, narcissism will come in, and they feel like they have to be bigger or better than everyone else around them. And those people 
aren't fun to be around. As a matter of fact, any of these people in a mood state that, that are the negative mood states, it's not fun to be around any of those people. And the sad thing is, is that some of these people have no understanding at all that they have moved to this place. And if you went up to them and asked them, if you went up to somebody that was just greedy about everything, and you said, how long have you been this way? They may say, I, I don't know. I didn't even know that I was. But even if they went for counseling or something like that, they may not even know the one thing that set it off. But I promise you, there was an event that happened that they processed into their life, but that it wasn't resolved. And because it wasn't resolved, it became a very negative way. You just don't wake up one day bitter. Something happens, like anger. Anger is an emotion. Anger is supposed to be brief. Jesus said, the Bible says, be ye angry, you know the last part of that verse, and sin not. Be angry, but don't sin. Matter of fact, it says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Anger is an emotion that's supposed to be brief. If it ceases to be brief, it moves into a state of what they call rage or wrath. That's dangerous. But if that is not controlled, it moves into a different state, another state, a state of being called bitterness. You just don't wake up one day and become bitter. Bitterness. Have bitterness in your life. Something will happen to you, and you have apprehension. Not a thing wrong with that. Not a thing at all wrong with that. Just like anger. Nothing wrong with anger. It's what you do with anger. Being apprehensive about something, that's not necessarily wrong. But when you don't deal with it correctly, then apprehension will become fear. And when fear remains, it becomes terror until you are terrorized by it. You can work through the healing process or you can live in negativity if you look to God if you look to truth you can work through the process and find help for instance you have a loved one that meant the world to you and 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 they die you have loss in your life now there's not a thing you can do about that but you better do something about it there are feelings that you will fear but we know those feelings and we call them grief and you know there are stages to grief there are healthy stages to grief. First of all, despair, uh, disassociation. You know, what am I going to do? This person I loved is gone. What am I going to do? You have despair. And then you get angry about it. Why did this person have to die? I don't understand. Matter of fact, sometimes people even get angry at God because of this. But then they'll move into the third stage, which is called bar bartering, bargaining, bargaining with God. Lord, I'll do this if you do this. Isn't it funny? A person is already dead and gone, and we're trying to make some kind of agreement. But then we move, if we're healthy, we'll move through the bargaining stage, and then we get to that place called despair. It may begin in denial. But we move through it, and then we find our place of despair. But here's the thing about it. If you move through despair, you'll finally come to the conclusion we call acceptance. So you, you may begin with denial, then get angry, then you barter with God, then you have despair. But if you find acceptance, then you've found truth, and you can move on. And everything can be good again. Everything can be alive again. So... Walking with God, back through the beginning of it, you can find a healthy place. As a matter of fact, we call this healthy place, you ready for this, homeostasis. A place of equilibrium. A place of good balance. It can come just from finding the peace of God in that circumstance, in that situation. Now, let's get a little deeper here satan does not want you to get better he came to steal kill and destroy he comes to trip you up knock you down he wants to kick at you when you are down he wants to laugh at you and he wants to make you a spectacle against the goodness of god 
That's who Satan is. His goal is to disciple us into becoming our worst possible self. He wants us to go from bad to worse to the loss of hope. But that's not the way God wants it to be. As a matter of fact, I want to give you Jesus' own words about Satan's ways and his methods. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, let me, let me read, you, read to you the word of God. When he's speaking to this group of people who are so controlled by Satan's influence, Jesus said this, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him, none whatsoever. Satan may bring some things to your life, but understand, it's all falsehood. It's all wrong. He has nothing good within him. He's totally lies. Now listen to me. Sometimes we can take a truth and make a lie out of it. A half-truth is a full lie. Satan even quoted the Word of God to Jesus, but he quoted it out of context. He quoted against the truth. That's a full lie. The word, Jesus said, he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. The CSB version says he speaks out of his own nature. As God speaks out of his own nature of good, Satan speaks out of his own nature of lies. But I love how the New American Standard version uses this. The New American Standard says when he lies, he speaks out of his native nature language like English is my native language and I'm speaking to you out of my la native language lies are the native native language of Satan for he is a liar and Jesus said he's the father of lies he began him in the garden of Eden when he lied to Adam and Eve he's been doing it ever since and I think we need to quit listening to him call him a liar call him the father of lies Quit believing the false truths. Quit believing the half-truths and turn to the God who is always going to lead us in truth and right. This should never be an occasion for a Christian is to follow in lies. We are made to be like our Heavenly Father. May we never follow the actions of Satan. So James says, in James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. It might be hard for you to see the joy, but count it joy. This word count is quite unique. It denotes a belief resting in our own inner feelings and sentiments. Hold on now. It, it, it denotes a belief resting not only in our inner feelings and sentiments, but due to the consideration of an outside source. So when he says, count it joy, literally he is saying, it may not be natural for you to count it joy, but once you consider it, once you look at it, once you uh, take accounting for it, once you change your thinking toward it, you will find that it is joy. Now, remember when I told you that there were all those states of being and I, I told you that there were all those negative states of being like narcissism and anxiety and, and bitterness and, 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 and greed, selfishness, all those things? You know, there are good states of being too. As a matter of fact, James uh, chapter 5, verse 22 says that, that we have fruit of the Spirit of God, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and one of my favorites that I'm still working on, self-control. All of these things, 
are literally states of being. Now, Pastor, what in the world are you talking about? I'm saying that, that um, Ephesians 5.8 says that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that is one of the most important verses in all the New Testament for the Christian. Like John 3.16 is so important to the non-believer, the one like Nicodemus who had yet to come know Jesus Christ, the personal Savior and Lord. I think one of the most important scriptures for the Christian, for the believer, is Ephesians 5.18. Be continuously filled with the Spirit of God. I can't feel myself. I need, though, to be filled. So be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means I need the Holy Spirit to come and fill me. I need the Holy Spirit to come with His nature, with His nature, and act upon me. I can't do it of myself. I can't produce that fruit. But the one who can, he can come and produce love in me. When I don't have love, when I'm empty of love, it's the work of God to come and do in me what I can't do. To produce love in me, he's the only one who can produce heavenly love. Joy is what God wants us to have. Listen to me now. At all times, in every place, in every situation, no matter what, he says, let the Holy Spirit come and produce joy in you. Peace. You just can't walk around saying, I'm going to have peace. I'm going to have peace. I'm going to have peace. You'll have the opposite end. But if you allow him, he is there to continuously produce peace in you. And that word that I don't like very much, patience. And that's really when he's talking about this in, in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. He says, this is the work that he's going to produce in your life through these various trials, these different difficulties and circumstances. He said, God's going to come, come in and he's going to produce joy in your life by having to go through these terrible circumstances. It will produce patience. I wish there was a way around that, don't you? But there's not. And we could say, Kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness. Oh, I need the Holy Spirit to produce gentleness in me. Self-control. I'm thinking about I'm a control freak and I, I'm going to hold on to this and I'm not going to do that. And then I go do it. You see, I might be a control freak, but I'm not in control unless the Holy Spirit is in control. But if I let the Holy Spirit produce something in me, even out of me, I can have the power of God producing in me what I cannot do otherwise. You see, there are people that go around and say, look, if I can just be happy for maybe like 90 days, then I'll just have joy. If I could just be happy for 90 minutes, right? There are things that we go through that, that they're, they're absolutely going to fight against those things. There are difficulties that we're going to have to walk through. It's just a constant state. It's just the difficulties of things called life. We have the availability of having joy that comes from God, but Satan wants to be a wrecker of our joy, a destroyer of our joy. But Jesus is the source of all joy. Back in Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.7, that verse that we know so well, for God didn't give us a spirit of fear. That spirit of fear came from Satan. But God gave us love or power, love and sound thinking, the spirit of power, the spirit of love, the spirit of sound thinking. That verse many of us know and have memorized. But I want to remind you of the very verse before that. Before Paul said to his young apprentice, Timothy, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. The very verse before that, he says, Therefore, based on these things, young Timothy, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. Timothy, as you're pastoring this church, I, I'm, I'm going to remind you, you need to stir up the Spirit of God in you. You need to open yourself up, empty yourself of everything else, and stir up that Spirit that lives and resides and abides and guides and encourages and strengthens. You need to let that Spirit of God come in. Stir it up. Or the spirit of fear will take you down. 
Stir it up and you can have the spirit of power over that circumstance. You can have the spirit of love, God's love, that can, from the cross of Calvary could say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The spirit of correct thinking, when you're not seeing things straight, when you're stirred up because of things that happened in your past and you're afraid that they're going to happen again and you're afraid that you're going to lose something, let God come in. Let God bless. Let God lead you. James says, count it all joy when you fall in to these various trials, when you let them become part of your life. It's about walking with God through them. You can't avoid them. We're all going to lose someone. If we live long enough, we're going to lose someone. The first person that I, I lost personally that, I mean, I lost friends and other things, but I, I remember in the eighth grade losing a classmate. I remember the beginning of my senior year in high school losing my sister-in-law. You can't make those things not going away. Uh, you can't make them just, uh, you can't have avoidance. You just can't put them out of your thinking. I'm just not going to think about that. They're coming back. You've got to deal with them. So in verse 3, after he says, my brethren, count on all joy when you fall into various trials, he says, knowing that. Now you're not going to know that until you know it. And you're not going to know it until you experience it. There's some things I, I've experienced, and I know. There's some things that I've walked through, and I've found the power of God there, and God has been real and true in my life, and I can look at that, and I can say, yes, God is good. There's some other things I haven't experienced yet, so God's not through with me, and God will listen to me now, lovingly allow me to go through things where I find the end of myself because when I find the end of myself, I find the beginning of God. So I'll find a trial or a difficulty that's bigger than me and I'll know it's bigger than me. Matter of fact, at first I might not and I might try to challenge it myself out of the human strength, but that won't work. And because I'm a believer in God, I'll quickly recognize that and I'll get it out of my strength into his strength. And then I'll see the power of God shine through. Because the Holy Spirit will be working on me. But what I need is I need an experiential power. Knowing God. Knowing His love. Knowing the peace that goes, goes beyond all understanding. So you might not be there yet, but if we connect with God and walk with God, He says, knowing that the testing of your faith, the trial, the crucible, this word testing is the same word when, when they make steel today. Uh, they don't want it to be weak steel, so they'll put it through trials and tests to see the strength of it. So when God looks at your faith, he's not going to throw you out there on your own. He's going to let you go through some trials and tribulations and hardships and difficulties. So in the, in the crucible of his love, I love to say it this way, with God's protection and hand of anointing with you. You can walk through these things. And he can protect you and keep you. And then you will experience God in those moments. Without the testing of your faith. Without the trial. Without that proving ground. Without that purifying process. How would we ever fully come to know the trust and the goodness and our hope in God? I want you to Think about um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, 7, and 8. Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice. Now, that perks my attention up. When he's talking about we're not going to just rejoice, we're going to greatly rejoice. All right. So when he says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Same word James used. Various difficulties, various hardships, various differing trials. Peter says, if need be, you have been grieved, you have been hurt, you have had to face it in your motion, these various trials. Why? That the genuineness of your faith, 
the faith that's been through the testing process, that crucible of fire, and it's found itself strong, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. May be, may be found to praise glory in that circumstance may be found to, to praise the revelation of God in me during that difficulty and that hardship, that there will be great glory of God that can be seen. And I personally believe that would not be seen otherwise if we had not gone through that difficulty. can only be seen in our lives as we walk through it with God, found His grace sufficient, come through that difficulty, that that hardship, the thing that we would love to avoid, but yet it was better for us. He says, whom in have not seen, this Jesus, whom in you have not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, listen to me now, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end, ending of your faith, the end of your faith, the salvation of of your soul how needful how necessary and spoken from a man who is saying I understand that time is coming short for me the things that Jesus said about me are about to give my, I'm going to give my life and be martyred for him things that you would never have known otherwise I've been preaching for over 32 years and when I was a young preacher, there was a lot of things that I was preaching that I knew they were true because they were things from the Word of God, but I had not experienced them yet. Now there are times that I can talk about a few subjects. And there's a different anointing in my preaching because I'm not preaching theory that I haven't lived yet, though I know it's true. I'm preaching fact. When I was a young preacher, I had the joy of listening and hearing and uh, a, a pastor who became an evangelist uh, heard him preach. I can't tell you how many times I heard him preach. I read all of his books. As a matter of fact, it, it got to the place where I could email him and he would email me back. That's before we had all the cell phones and stuff like that. His name was Ron Dunn. He was one of the most anointed preachers I ever heard. Matter of fact, uh, another preacher that I love so very much called Adrian Rogers said of Ron Dunn that every time he preaches and every time he hears him preach, he learns something. He said of Ron Dunn, every time he hears him, he hears something fresh. And I always loved Ron Dunn. I always loved his sermons. And one time he preached a sermon about a, a difficulty that I had not known that he had gone through in his life. He had a son. He called him Ronnie. He was Ron Jr. And his son was bipolar. Many of you know what that means. Bipolar is uh, an emotional imbalance in your mind, a, a chemical, literally a chemical imbalance in your mind. Uh, we've risen to a place that in our day today, we call it a mental, mental disease that a person would have. And there are drugs that can help that can uh, bring to homeostasis in the mind, that where they can, that chemical imbalance can become balanced again, and they can live a quite normal life. But for Ronnie, as it is for many people that I have met and experienced today, that when they, on their meds, they're good, and everything feels wonderful, and they don't think they need to take their meds anymore, and they get off their meds, and the next thing you know, they get manic again in their life. And all those bipolar behaviors, super highs, uh, super lows, and that's what happened to Ronnie. And they went through years uh, of dealing with their son and finding him the best doctors and counselors and everyone that they could work with him. And, and, and when Ronnie was on his drugs, he did well. But one day, Ronnie went to the front yard and committed suicide in the front yard. And, of course, Ron did what probably most parents would do. They blamed themselves went through those processes of 
of grieving, despair, um, anger, bargaining with God, you know. And they went through his pants. His mom went through his pants and found in his blue jeans that he was going to school every day, but he was putting his meds in the pocket of his pants. He found that in one of those times where of, the, of the deepest, darkest of despair, when his, he really wasn't thinking straight, he committed suicide. And Ron went through this process of dealing with the emotions and the grief, but he didn't process them as well immediately. And days to weeks to months to a year, he actually wrote a book called When Heaven is Silent about his journey through his self-described walk of darkness. And he talked about the time that he went on vacation. And everywhere that he went, he found that depression there because the losing of his child. Not to tell his whole story, but he found the goodness of God. As a matter of fact, it was one of the works of God that God allowed him to walk through some of these stages of despair because then he could understand better. He could, as verse 3 says, knowing that. Experientially walking through it and knowing that the testing of your faith produces the fruit of the Spirit, patience, or all of those fruits of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, Ron said that it, it became almost a, a supernatural part of his ministry as other people who had going through the very same thing would come to him for help. And, and it's not like he had all the answers, but he could look at them and say, if you follow these things, you'll find the same God I found. Then God began to do a work in my life, and I, I began to find a trait among the people that I looked up to so very much. And it was almost scary how much of my favorite preachers, the ones that spoke life into me, the ones that had done so very much for my life, that I almost kind of say I, I kind of grew up at their feet seeing what God had done in their life and how God had blessed their churches. I found that just about all of them went through unbelievable trials in their life. One had a... a a special needs child. One, uh, my wife went to a conference and, and heard one of their wives speak and she had a closet in her house that she would go, shut herself off, close the clo closet doors and, and literally scratch at the carpet. One who, a uh, uh, pastor who walked through a, a divorce because his wife was in absolutely full despair. One that, uh, well, Adrian Rogers who had a child that was stillborn. Came home from church on a Sunday, wife cooking food. And then, even in that moment, he uh, saw that the child was still. Went over and grabbed it. It was turning blue. Rushed out. Didn't call 911, got in his car and ran to the hospital. And the baby did not survive. And I think of sometimes, you know, when I would look to these heroes and I'd say, man, I wish I could preach like. I, I wish I had the anointing of God that Adrian Rogers had. I wish I could understand what Jerry Vines went through or, or Manly Beasley went through or, or all these great men of God. But then I, I, I don't understand or realize all the things that they went through that God allowed them. Most of us, Wish that we never had to face those difficulties. But in the darkest of times, we see the greatest of blessings. Let me read to you from 1 Peter again, chapter 4, verse number 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. No, don't. Don't think it's unusual or strange or different. This is not some strange thing. But he says, but rejoice. <laughs> rejoice 
to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. Rejoice to the, to the way that you can walk through it. Re rejoice to the way that you can see it at this moment in time. Rejoice to it. You, you might learn more later down the road, but, but right now, look at it and give God glory in that. To the ability that you are able, to the extent that you can partake of Christ's suffering, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Not just joy, exceeding joy. Abundant joy. Joy that works. Joy that helps. You can live in a state of joy. It doesn't mean things won't hurt. But it also doesn't mean that you'll get knocked off your feet and go through the despair. I have one example that I think is the greatest example that I know of. In the first century, there was a, a disciple of the apostle John. John lived a long life. And at the end of that, his life, he was exiled to uh, Patmos. But there was a man by the name of Polycarp who was a disciple of John's. He grew in the faith. Matter of fact, one of the greatest blessings that we have at the end of the first century and into the second century, the recordings of, of Polycarp, the writings of Polycarp. He, like many in his day, were told that you cannot preach the gospel. Matter of fact, he was told not to preach the gospel. Matter of fact, he was, it was declared of him that if you do not preach the, stop preaching the gospel, you will be killed. And he, like uh, Peter and John, at the, uh, when the Acts chapter 3 and 4, when they told them that they had to quit preaching or they would go through uh, trials and persecutions, they said, we cannot help but you know, speak the things that we have seen and heard. Polycarp was told that he would be burned at the stake. Could you imagine that? I'm told that's one of the most painful things. The, the, the nerve endings are on the outside of the skin, and when we're burned, we feel the most pain. And They would literally take Christians, tie them to a pole, build wood around the bottom of it, and literally burn them at the stake. Obviously, they would tie people to the pole so that they could not run away. But when it came time for Polycarp to be burned at the stake, he said, you don't have to tie me up. You don't have to do it, chain me. You don't have to do any of those things. And he walked voluntarily there before them. And we are told that he prayed for those who set him aflame. And he stood there until his life was taken and absent from the body, present with the Lord. Folks, you don't walk through circumstances like that without knowing God and experiencing God and finding out that He is true and finding out that He is good and finding out that He is able. You know, my goal for all of us through the uncertainty of this world is just to let Jesus be Jesus. I know that the world wants us to be afraid. I know that the world wants to have it be in despair. And all the crazy, absolute uh, well, I call it stinking thinking that's out there. I just want you to know that God is good. And you can trust him. And you may never have walked through anything difficult like that before. But you can trust him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, our God, our Master, our Savior. I am so grateful that you are the mighty God who saves. And that you save us to the uttermost. That you are able to keep us. Lord, I, I thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us, and you are with us, and you are there to give us exactly the, uh, the strength that we need, that fruit of the Spirit. So Lord, bless us with the overwhelming power that comes only from you. And Lord, my prayer is that those that are listening now, when they pause at the end of this, that they too will enter into prayer to you. And Lord, that they would get honest and start talking about some of the things that they haven't dealt with yet. Some of the things that have hurt them. Some of those feelings that have yet to be resolved. Some maybe a, a day or two old, maybe a week or a month or a year. 
Maybe some so long that they can't remember not even feeling that way. Lord, I pray that they will come and lay them down before you, almighty God that you are. Lord, you can begin that process of blessing, that process of process of love, and power, sound thinking, the word that we use today. May we find our homo- homeostasis in you. Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May God bless you. And my God help you in all the days that are ahead.